I'm Helena Conradi, CEO of Satrix, and I'll be your host today. I'm very excited to welcome you to our first webinar under the Index More initiative. So what is Index More? It's an educational collaboration between Satrix, the leading index manager in South Africa, and BlackRock iShares, the largest ETF provider globally. The intention is to provide appropriate and targeted content to the South African investor, you, that speaks to more than just index investing, introducing the index more concept. So in the next few months, we'll be presenting a broad range of topics, including China, ESG, and many more, leverage of the insights of both ourselves and, and BlackRock. Today, we are starting the discussion with a focus on mega trends, structural shifts that are longer term in nature and have irreversible consequences for the world around us. BlackRock has come up with a list of five mega trends that they believe are likely to shape our global economic, political and social landscape in the years to come. But before we begin, just some house rules. Uh, you have joined the call on mute and without video, so don't worry. So the way to engage with the discussion is to type your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Only Rob and I can see your questions and we will try to pick up on as many as possible at the end of the session. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and we'll send you a copy in the next few days. So no need to worry if you experience technical difficulties on your side or need to leave the call at any time. So let's talk about mega trends, a topic of interest to all of us on this call. I'm delighted to introduce you to our speaker for this afternoon, Rob Powell. He is Head of Thematic and Sector Strategy for BlackRock's Active Equities Group, as well as Lead Strategist for the IFA's Thematic Range. Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. We are looking forward to learning more. Over to you. Thank you very much, Helena, and uh, thank you all, everybody on the line, uh, for taking the time to listen to what we've, we've got to say today. We really appreciate um, your engagement. Um, so, so as, as Helena said, um, I uh, work at BlackRock. I'm based in London um, and I'm the head of thematic and sector product strategy um, for the firm. So uh, real, have a real focus on mega trends. So um, what we're going to do today is to, to take you through some slides which cover um, three things. And I'm going to share my screen now on Zoom um, so that you can see the slides. Um, these things are defining what megatrends are uh, and why they're an in interesting investment opportunity now. Um, talk about disruption that we see, see playing out right now, particularly the disruption of transport and uh, how internal combustion engines are going to be rapidly replaced by electric vehicles um, in the next few years if our forecasts are correct. Uh, and then finally, we're going to look at what we see as the five key megatrends driving change um, in the world uh, and leading uh, and giving rise to very interesting investment opportunities for the next 10, 20 or 30 years. So um, if I can click through, what is megatrends investing all about? Well, firstly, it's about identifying a megatrend. A megatrend is a large scale shift that affects everything that we do from how we live, how we work, um, the kind of technology that we interact with, something that is, and it's generally something that is happening on a global basis. So when we're looking to invest in these kinds of mega trends, uh, we're doing so without the traditional country or sector boundaries that have driven investment decision making in the past. Uh, we're not going to have themes um, or mega trends that are looking to access just China or just Europe because we think that megatrends are playing out on a global basis as we become increasingly connected as global citizens. And then finally, we're looking to allocate disproportionately to the winners of these global megatrends. We're, we're looking to overweight within portfolios the companies that we think can really benefit and win from the disruption that we see playing out in the world. So why do we do this? Well, at a company level, we believe that by allocating to companies that are aligned to megatrends, um, that these companies are going to generate above average earnings. So that means that they're basically going to be, we see that they're going to be more profitable over the long term um, because 
um, they are aligned to this long-term disruption. So taking electric vehicles, by example, we think that electric vehicle manufacturers are going to be way more profitable for the long term than internal combustion engine vehicles because of the challenges that internal, in, in, internal combustion engine vehicle manufacturers are facing. And we do, and we like to focus on this area as well because we think that change is accelerating. We're going to see this later on and we're going to see examples from the past in a moment. Um, but we think that the pace of change within technology is reaching unprecedented levels that's so looks set to continue for the next few years. And this is all playing out in a world where growth is harder to find. We've obviously seen a black swan event affecting global markets in the last few months. Um, and we've seen massive volatility within equity markets. But over there's been a key trend over the last few years where finding strong growth within equity markets is increasingly challenging. Um, and we think that by allocating to companies that are very well aligned to megatrends, that um, you can find growth in this low growth world in which we all are operating in. Um, we also think, as I already said, that this disruption is playing out across borders. We're not going to just be focusing on single countries or regions. We want uh, investment products and propositions to be able to invest wherever the opportunities are most prevalent. Why is it relevant to give yourself um, an arbitrary boundary like a European equity boundary um, when you could be accessing interesting investment opportunities on a global basis. Um, and we're doing this all with the aim of generating some outperformance against global equities. We want to be able to provide investment propositions that can really be additive within a portfolio context by leading to outperformance against standard um, plain vanilla market cap weighted global equity indices. And this begs the question, how do you actually invest in megatrends? Well, it's all about finding themes or long-term trends that are aligned to these drivers of disruption. And this is where some confusion sometimes comes in because um, the term investment theme is a well-written phrase that often appears in financial press. But we see that there are two kinds of, broadly two kinds of investment themes. The first is a cyclical investment theme. Um, these investment themes are very short term in nature and generally are driven by a view on where we are within the business cycle. They tend, they tend to be mean reverting. You're investing for over a six or a 12 month period. Uh, and they're driven by the things that you see along the top of this slide. So volatility, asset valuations, interest rates, currency values. This is all about taking a short term view on where you believe and markets are likely to move as an investor. And then there are structural themes. Structural themes are much longer term in nature, um, and they're all about a permanent change in the current economic environment. We're not looking for mean reverting themes, as in the case with cyclical themes. We're looking for a permanent change in the status quo. The shift from the internal combustion engine vehicle to the electric vehicle is a great example of this. This is something which is not going to revert, and we think that by allocating to these long-term structural trends, structural themes that are underpinned by the mega trends that we're talking about today, um, that you can reduce the impact of the business cycle uh, and have long-term outperformance versus global equities. But this begs the question, given that we're inherently taking a forward-looking view on where markets are likely to move when it comes to mega trends, which trends have played out in the past and where have opportunities uh, been um, that we can look at as evidence for this kind of shift playing out and, and having large scale, dis the kind of large scale disruption that we're looking to capture within our portfolios. And a great example is the introduction of television. Um, so in, the, in 1946, 0.01% um, of households in the United States had access to a television. We use data from the United States because this is the most readily available data that we have. And one of the rationales for allocating to structural shifts is that they're always or very frequently underappreciated by investors in the market. And that's our key rationale here. So if you invest in a structural shift that is beginning to accelerate, you are likely to generate above average returns because they are, they are often underappreciated by investors and policymakers and consumers alike. So from 0.01% of 
households in the US having access to a TV in 1946, we saw a dramatic shift to 90% of households having access to a TV um, in 1960. So in just a 14-year period, we see this huge adoption of new technology. And this is exactly the kind of shift that we're looking to capture within our portfolio. And this isn't just affecting a single company. This is affecting whole industries. So yes, the television manufacturers did well, but think how the networks and the media, oper media operators did, and also the advertising um, the advertising executives and the advertising companies who suddenly could reach a nationwide audience, whereas before they were just uh, constrained to very local audiences. So we're looking to capture these kind of shifts and the knock-on effects across multiple industries, uh, which lends itself well to a broad, diversified exposure to a theme. And there's many different examples of this kind of uh, disruption from other uh, other technologies. Here you just have technology adoption curves um, from first introduction to, um, to mass penetration um, and how quickly these new technologies do take hold. From the fridge, the TV, the microwave, the internet, we see these hockey stick-like adoption curves playing out. Um, and one that we find particularly interesting at the moment to look at um, which I've already mentioned a couple of times, is the shift away from internal combustion engines more towards electric vehicles. And this is a great example where we believe that policymakers um, in particular are underappreciating the scale of the shift and forecasters. And this is providing us with significant investment opportunities, despite this being a well-accepted um, shift that is starting to play out. So if we now add on OPEX forecast for internal for electric vehicle um, adoption over the next few years, you can see that the curves have a dramatically different shape. Not hockey stick-like, very much flatter. Um, and this was their forecast in 2017, and they've already had to up this forecast in 2018. Um, and we expect that this curve to be increasingly hockey stick-like as, um, as consumers, as regulation, societal shift, um, and uh, economic force take hold. And these three key aspects are what we look for in all of our themes. Um, and all of our structural shifts that we're looking to capture driven by megatrends is the convergence of these three factors, regulation, societal change, and economic force. And when we look at this um, convergence with, um, with vehicles at the moment, you can see a really strong picture emerging um, when it comes to the, the pace of change and the disruption that we're expecting to play out. So regulation, what's happening when it comes to vehicles? Well, firstly, there's huge pressure um, on companies um, and vehicle manufacturers to have cleaner vehicles. Um, and um, so we're seeing a real downward path in um, emissions coming from vehicles. You can see on the red line there, the average CO2 emissions um, for vehicles has been on a downward path um, since the early 2000s, driven by regulation. But you see it flattening out in 27, 2018. And you can just see from the yellow line how stringent the forward-looking targets are. And we think that this is going to be impossible for internal combustion engine vehicle manufacturers to meet these targets, which lends itself uh, very well to electric vehicle manufacturers coming to the fore um, and being the most prevalent kind of vehicle that is going to be sold um, going forwards. So regulators are a key driver of this shift and a key driver of all of the shifts that we're looking to capture when it comes to megatrends investing. Secondly, societal force. Now, societal force is all about changing consumer preference and the views of the global society. And this is arguably the hardest to quantify. Um, when it comes to electric vehicles, this is all about the perception of climate change when it comes to consumption. And we're seeing an increasing, um, increasing requirement for consumers, for companies to be climate aware. And this isn't, just, um, this isn't just in the vehicle manufacturing space, this is across many different industries. We have slides like this um, in a number of our decks where we used to be updating, we used to find new data points and new article entries every year or so, every couple of years. And we now find it easy to find new and relevant articles on a much more regular basis because the pace of change and 
uh, the focus on climate for investors is increasing. We've also seen what we refer to in Europe as the Greta effect. Greta Thunberg going around and raising the profile of all of these climate related issues is having a huge impact on how consumers are behaving. And this is also a key shift um, or a key driver of the shift from internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles as consumers want to have vehicles that are emitting less carbon and are better for the global environment. So societal shift, a very important driver um, of interesting investment opportunities when it comes to investing in megatrends as well. And then finally, economic shifts and economic forces. So this is all about, um, this is all about it becoming impossible for, for uh, consumers and manufacturers or product providers to avoid the potential of these kind of themes because it's becoming economically way more attractive for them to be involved um, in the disruption than in the incumbent industry. Um, and when it comes to electric vehicles, it's all about battery costs. You can see that just in the decade between 2010 um, and 2019, we've seen a massive drop um, in the cost of um, batteries that go into electric vehicles. Batteries account for about 40% of the overall cost of an electric vehicle. Um, so if we see falling battery costs, we see those falling costs passed on to the consumer. Um, Many forecasters expect that by 2025, we're going to have battery costs below $100, kilowatt, $100 per kilowatt hour, um, which is the magic tipping point when electric vehicles are going to become cheaper to run uh, and to purchase than internal combustion engine vehicles, making it extremely or increasingly viable um, for consumers to purchase an electric vehicle versus an internal combustion engine vehicle. So um, when we see the convergence of these three kinds of shifts, um, we see strong opportunities for structural change, and we expect the disruption to accelerate, um, beating the, uh, the underwhelming OPEC and, for, uh, OPEC and policymaker forecasts and becoming much more hockey stick like and exponential in terms of the rate of growth of change within a theme. So what are the five key mega trends that we have that we believe um, are the most important drivers of change? Well, what you see on this slide is BlackRock's view on what the most important drivers of change in the world are going to be over the next 10, 20 or 30 years. So climate change and resource scarcity um, are first um, and arguably largest scale mega trend or most relevant mega trend at the moment. When we first wrote our research on mega trends, um, we had a statistic, a slightly alarming statistic within uh, that white paper, which was that between the year 2000 and 2016, we'd seen 15 of the 16 hottest years um, ever recorded. Um, in 2017, we had to revise that number to have 16 of the 17 ever hottest years on record. Um, in 2018, we had to do the same thing. And in 2019, um, it remains to be seen whether um, we will have to revise the number for 2020. We're obviously living in an extremely, um, an extremely challenging time where we've had global lockdowns driven by um, the coronavirus pandemic, but um, global temperatures have been on an irreversible path. Um, a slightly alarming statistic that I also read about temperature changes is that um, we've reduced um, by being on lockdown, we've reduced carbon emissions globally by around 5.5 percent, which is a relatively small number given that there are so many fewer planes in the sky and cars on the road at the moment. Um, the Paris Climate Accord and the World Economic Forum believe that for us to reach the 1.5 degree target that they've put in place um, uh, in terms of global temperature rises from pre-industrial levels, uh, we have to reduce um, global temperatures by 7.5 percent. Um, global carbon emissions, sorry, by 7.5% every year between now and 2030 to even come close to achieving that target. Um, so despite the global lockdown, there's still a huge amount more to do. Um, but we're looking for the positive um, changes that are going to result from um, mega trends like climate change. We've already seen the electric vehicles theme, which is a key, uh, which is one, and you know, one of the key drivers of this uh, theme is um, the climate change and resource scarcity megatrend. Secondly, demographics and social change. So this megatrend is all about 
um, large scale changes in global population dynamics. And a key change that we're monitoring here is the global aging population. Um, and you know, there's some startling statistics on, on this as well, because in 2019, um, it was the first year where there were more 65 year olds in the world um, than people under the age of five. So we already have a very um, aged population globally. Uh, and we expect this shift to continue to play out. The UN uh, believe that there's only one country in the world where over 30% of the population is aged 60 or older, and that country is Japan. Um, they also believe that by 2050, there are going to be 55 countries where 30% of the population is over the age um, over the age of 60. If we look at China specifically, which is one area where we see a hugely aging population, which is massively underappreciated by most investors who believe that this is a Western or predominantly American um, uh, theme that is playing out, um, there are already 20 million people in China over the age of 80. Um, and the UN believes that by 2050, there are going to be 120 million people over the age of 80 in China alone. So I believe that's double the population of South Africa, just in people over the age of 80 um, in China. So very much um, a global problem here. But again, we're looking to focus on the positive aspects of this kind of shift. So can we over allocate to healthcare companies that are treating uh, chronic diseases that become increasingly prevalent in old age? Or can we invest in uh, in, in aging leisure companies, which are very well aligned to um, changing consumer behavior as people get older. Technological breakthrough, we've already touched on quite a bit in the presentation, but this is about the pace of change in technology. We believe that change uh, within technology in the past has happened in a linear fashion. And some people often say to us that having technological change or technological breakthrough as one of the key megatrends is a bit of a cop out. But the way that we see it is that it's a it's a bit of it's an enabler of all of the other megatrends that we have here um, and we see that exponential growth and exponential change is going to be playing out within technology if we look at all of the kids um, who uh, by way of an example if we look at all of the kids who are currently entering primary school so um, six and seven year olds who are starting schooling at the moment and we fast forward um, and we fast forward until they're 21, so in 15 years or so. Um, forecasters believe that 70% of those kids, when they're entering the workforce, will have jobs that don't currently exist today because disruption of existing industries and technological change will, have, will mean that many of the existing jobs are simply obsolete. So this is a key shift that we're monitoring um, and something that we see as an enabler of all of our other five key megatrends. Rapid urbanization is all about um, the mass migration of people from living in rural areas to living in urban areas. Um, this has been a steady shift that we've seen playing out over the last, um, over the last 20 years or so, um, but one that is really starting to accelerate. And again, this is happening um, predominantly within Asia. Um, we already know that there are 100 cities in China with populations of over 1 million people. And that compares to eight cities um, within the United States, just by way of context. So China is already a massively urban society. Shenzhen, the fourth biggest city within China, um, had a population of around 30,000 people in the late 70s. It's now um, got a population of 14 million people. So we've seen massive urbanization of that society already, but we expect this to continue and at an alarming rate. So from, um, from 100 cities with populations of over 1 million today, we expect that by 2030, there are going to be 200 cities within China with populations of over a million people. Um, and again, despite the slightly sl scary sounding, sounding um, statistics, there's some hugely interesting investment opportunities that we can look to capture um, by focusing on this trend. So the infrastructure requirement um, of building these new cities and the different kind of infrastructure that is going to be required for modern city, dw city dwellers is going to be way more connected, way more tech enabled um, than the older cities that, that most people in the world currently dwell in. And finally, changing economic power. Um, this is all about the emerging global wealth. So um, the inc an increasing proportion of GDP coming from the currently emerging markets of China and India 
at the expense of the US. Um, and there's some amazing statistics here about growing middle classes. So 150 million people enter um, middle classes um, every single year um, and have those changing consumer preference that, um, that, that happens when people enter the middle class in, in terms of increased focus on leisure. Um, and 90% of those, um, those new middle classes are coming from Asia. Another statistic that I saw that I really liked um, on this recently is that China uh, mints two new billionaires per week. So there's an increasing opportunity for, um, for populations within Asia, in India and China particularly, to, to drive this shift of global economic growth away from the United States and Europe and more towards um, the currently emerging markets. And this is why we focused on, the, uh, at the start of the presentation, um, the description of all thematic and mega trends investing needing to be unconstrained. We want in our investment propositions um, to be able to invest wherever the opportunities are most pre prevalent. Um, so just to sum up, um, we believe that mega trends are the most important drivers of disruption within the world. And if we focus on investment themes that are driven by these mega trends, that we can really add value in a portfolio context uh, and generate some outperformance versus standard global equity markets. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Having listened to you, it reminds me of a quote in your report, the future is getting here faster. And uh, even uh, more so with COVID, uh, Yuval Harari also described it very well, pandemics fast forward history. So that's quite scary, um, but fascinating at the same time. Mega trends have been around for a while, but now seem to be accelerating. <clears throat> so before we start with the questions, and uh, there's a couple of them, so be ready. Uh, let's do a quick poll. You should see the question coming up on your screen now. You can pick more than one answer. So which of these mega trends will be most affected by COVID-19, in your opinion? That's interesting. It seems like there's a like people are people are focusing on the positives here, which is brilliant. So, um, yeah, quite an interesting uh, split emerging between technology, uh, demographics, changing economic power. Um, yeah, I think that technology is a key area that we're looking at at the moment in terms of seeing this acceleration driven by. Um, acceleration of these te uh, of these technological breakthroughs driven by um, by covid um, there's many tech CEOs who are coming out and talking about how uh, talking about how we've seen two years worth of disruption uh, within two months driven by covid um, so that's very interesting that, that everybody's aligned on that front demographics and social change um, uh, I'm not sure how how covid is gonna gonna speed that up I suppose we're gonna have a a huge focus on healthcare going forward, um, driven by you know increasing R and D spend when it comes to looking for a vaccine, and we have seen uh, we have seen an increase in in focus there, uh, and changing economic power. Interesting as well. Uh, p potentially, maybe people think people voting for that one based on um, on the negatives, given that a lot of the um, a lot of the challenge a lot of um, there's a lot of news flow coming out at the moment about the relations between U the US and China and how uh, COVID um, has, has driven change there. Um, our view on that front is that, um, that, that long term, we don't expect, we don't expect significant, significant impact um, on, uh, on globalization because we think that the consumer forces are too strong uh, when it comes to, when it comes to um, providing opportunities for businesses to operate in, the, in those areas. Well, the one I'm surprised about is the low, the rapid urbanization, um, only 9%. So maybe I can ask you a question before I go to the, the audience questions. Um, 
that has been a significant mega trend over the last couple of, of years. And up to now, I don't think we've ever questioned the direction of, of the momentum. Super cities are economic uh, mouthpots uh, after all. But one of the many learnings from COVID-19 is something that tech companies probably have known for years now. Uh, virtual work is effective and a large part of the professional workforce can actually work from home. By definition, that actually opens up your choice of, of home. Um, Sometimes people might be able to work for a big corporate in a city like uh, Cape Town or New York while living somewhere in the countryside. Do you think this might have an effect on urbanization at all as a mega trend, or will it simply redefine the concept of smart cities? I think that's a great question and one that we have debated uh, extensively. Um, because of all of the great, uh, all of the great rationales that you, you've highlighted there. Um, our view is that the pull of the cities is too strong. Um, so, I mean, the reason that people are moving to cities is, um, you know, better healthcare outcomes um, within cities, more employment opportunities, um, better living conditions effectively. And we think that this pull is going to remain um, despite the, the potential for um, despite the potential for people working virtually. Um, I saw a statistic about um, virtual working in the United States, which said that only one in five jobs um, currently could be done virtually. Um, this may change through time, um, but it does just show that you are still needed to, it, many workers still need to be present when it comes to, uh, when it comes to work. Um, so we think that the urbanization trend, despite potentially a little bit of a blip driven by COVID at the moment, um, is going to continue um, when we're through the worst of the crisis. In terms of areas where we've seen um, where we've seen positive impact and acceleration driven by COVID, COVID, um, there really there are really three key areas that have emerged. Um, so the the first is um, the first is technology. Um, and you already alluded it to uh, about to, to it there, Helena. Um, you know that increasing adoption of virtual working and digitalization of many processes um, has really accelerated this. Um, this COVID has really accelerated shifts in those directions. And it's not just virtual working; it's um, the reduction in the usage of cash and the potential for fintech companies who are operating um, in that space. Um, and we've seen strong performance for technology related themes. The, the second area um, won't come as that much of a surprise either. Um, and it's, it's healthcare. We've seen this, uh, we've seen a huge emphasis from investors, particularly European investors on healthcare and companies that have high R&D spend. So companies who are looking for vaccines or looking for new technologies that are going to um, be disruptive within healthcare. Um, we, ex we, we've long been tracking um, healthcare related themes because of the global aging population and the increasing requirement for spending on healthcare as people get older. But again, we think this has been accelerated by COVID. Um, and there's obviously some um, convergence, like I was talking about before, between technology and healthcare um, in terms of uh, the drivers of those shifts. So we see more technology focused healthcare companies as being the beneficiaries of COVID predominantly. And then the last one, which may come as, as, some, as a bit of a surprise for some of those on the call, given the votes that we just had, um, is climate and climate related um, themes. We've seen a real um, resilience in, clim in companies that have low carbon emissions, for example, and who score well when it comes um, to environmental uh, to environmental scoring and environmental aspects of, of investing through the crisis, um, and we expect to see an acceleration of the reallocation of capital towards companies that are both defensive in terms of providing um, providing exposure to companies that um, that benefit when the sun shines or when the wind is blowing, um, but also are very much aligned to this long term structural shift and the societal preference for um, companies that aren't negatively affecting the climate. So yeah, three key areas of positivity um, accelerated through COVID, technology, healthcare, um, and climate-related um, exposures. 
Excellent. There seems to be a lot of uh, questions around investments coming through as well. So here's one that um, I would like you to ask uh, to answer. These trends seem rather consensus. So could it be already reflected in asset prices? So yes, some of that like technology, they are accelerated, but most of these things are, are trends that we're already familiar with. Um, is it that it's priced in already? Well, I think that's why I wanted to show earlier on the OPEC forecasts of electric vehicle adoption, because despite there being this um, huge acceptance that lots of these shifts are going to be playing out, we see a big underappreciation of the potential for the disruption. Um, if we look at solar installations, for example, as a, you know, a disruptor of fossil fuel power, um, and we look at forecasts by the International Energy Agency. Um, you know, over the last decade, they've had to increase their forecasts for um, solar installations every single year, um, and we've reached their um, 2030. Tar we reached their 2030 target a decade early um, for uh, you know for, for the solar installations, um, showing that despite it being a well-accepted fact that we're going to have to replace fossil fuels and that they're going to become increasingly uneconomical in future, there's massive underappreciation from the people who are meant to know most about it, as in the forecasters. And we see this, we see this aspect as providing um, huge amounts of investment opportunities. Now, the couple of questions here actually addressing a more practical question. How do you capture of these factors? How do you actually capture it in a factor in a fund? So it sounds like investing in any of these mega trends is really about investing in multiple sectors of the, the economy. So maybe is this is this correct, but also what is the representation of these mega trends in a broad market indices like the S&P 500 and in the world indices? Um, I think that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, because generally the rationale here um, uh, or what we're looking to capture is companies that are currently unrepresented, underrepresented within global equities, given the forward looking potential um, for the technologies that they're bringing. Um, so if we look at the top 10 positions, top 10 largest positions in the MSCI world index or the S&P 500 index, if we look at the top 10 today, and we look at the top 10 10 years ago, we'd see a very different picture. And if we go 10 years before that, we'd see a different picture again. Um, so what you're doing by investing in plain vanilla um, global equity indices is over allocating to companies that have already um, that have already grown significantly and become the biggest companies in the world. What thematic investing is all about is over allocating to companies that currently form a smaller part of global equity indices. Um, but are going to become much more important aspects within um, within all portfolios. Um, so to use a sporting analogy, um, I heard somebody describe this as, you know, it's, it's good players are where the ball currently is now. If you're playing soccer, for example, the great players are where the ball um, is going to be. And that's what thematic investing is all about. It's about trying to predict where global equity indices are going to to move towards, driven by disruption, and over allocating to the drivers of that disruption. Are you missing your sport, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> so here, the next one is: there's a lot of ESG questions coming through as well, um, and how you captured that. Uh, so if you look at the change, your fifth um, mega trend, if you look at the change in economic power from the west to the end, there's a new philosophy out there moving the world to a more sort of a collective way of thinking rather than that of the individual. And I think that is very much reinforcing economic and social sustainability. So in your view, does this accelerate ESG as an integral part of the investment decision rather than just a theme? So it's actually becoming more important than just a theme. Short answer, yes. We think that, um we think that companies um, who score favorably from an ESG perspective um, are likely to be rewarded um, on an ongoing basis by investors. 
um, there's definitely we're definitely seeing a massive convergence between um, sustainable investing um, and investing in mega trends. Obviously, we have climate change and resource scarcity as one of our key mega trends, but we see an increasing number of investors who are looking to over allocate to companies that are both um, driven by um, the shift towards ESG, um, but can also um, make a positive in impact and contribute positively towards an increasing shift. So electric vehicles is a great um, example because um, it's driven by climate change, but it's also uh, by investing in the theme, you're potentially accelerating the shift towards electric vehicles at the extent of um, internal combustion engine vehicles, um, which um, which is going to be positive for climate change. So it becomes self-fulfilling. So um, yes, we definitely do see um, companies that have strong ESG scores being increasingly rewarded um, in future. So here's a difficult one, and I'm going to combine a, a couple of questions here. How do you know which companies will be the winners? So if you knew that, um, that will be fabulous, uh, Rob. Meta, uh, Betamax versus uh, VH is Apple versus BlackBerry. And I want to continue with another question there, Adam. If you look at um, a range of firms, if you look at the, the COVID crisis, a range of firms uh, across themes like pharmaceuticals are said to benefit rather than a single company or stock, because it's nearly impossible to identify which one will be the, the winner actually. Does it mean that theme-based funds should rather should take preference over say more broad-based indices um, and very concentrated active funds? So I think that's one of the key questions when it comes to thematic investing is, is why would you not just buy a single stock um, that you feel is, is really well aligned to the kind of disruption and the shifts that we're talking about? Um, and one of the key reasons is company level risk. Um, you know, there may be one electric vehicle manufacturer in the world that is very high profile and uh, that is at the top of, uh, that is one of the larger companies in the world um, that has been a very strong performer. Um, but that company is, is very well, uh, I don't think I'm allowed to talk about individual company names, but that company uh, has a CEO who is, um, who is very, um, very well recognized. Um, and his actions office often have very significant effects on the share price of that company, um, causing massive volatility at times. So the, the rationale with thematic investing is that if you can capture, um, if you can capture exposure to a theme across a value chain, so you're not just investing in an, in an electric vehicle manufacturer, for example, you're investing in the battery manufacturers or the parts manufacturers that go into a car. You know, there are there are 15 times more um, semiconductors in an electric vehicle than there are in an internal combustion engine vehicle. So you can see the potential opportunity there way down the value chain. Um, if you can invest across the value chain and capture the theme like that, then um, you reduce the idiosyncratic risk associated with investing in a single company whilst retaining your exposure to that long-term disruption which you see playing out. So yeah, it's the, it's the trade-off between um, potentially extremely large returns in single um, single companies, but significant volatility. And when I say extremely large returns, you could also have extremely large losses versus investing in the value chain for a theme where you're more likely to have a smooth, or we hope you're more likely to have a smoothed outcome and reduce the idiosyncratic risk while retaining um, exposure to the disruption. Thank you so much, Rob, for your input. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. We, we're on uh, two o'clock. Um, so we'll have to leave it here, but thank you so much. And also thank you to all the participants. We've had a couple of questions here, very interesting, and I'm sad that we didn't get through all of them. But uh, please look out for the recording of our webinar um, if you would like to re-listen to it. And uh, also for the invite to our webinar on China. Uh, stay safe. <laughs>